how's everybody doing? How's our worship team out there, right? You were here for most of the singing. Anytime you're here early, feel free to join in. haven't heard this opening song it's a it's kind of a tough one to take sometimes like we are the body why aren't his arms reaching so but we're gonna get better at that right next year we're gonna just do everything we did good this year only better next year It's crowded in worship today As she slips in Trying to fade into the faces The girl's teasing laughter is caring Farther than they know Farther than they know If we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is? his coat and quietly sinks into the back row the weight of their judgmental glances tells him that his chances are better out on the road but if we are the body why aren't his arms reaching body Good morning. I told you it was a little strong, right? But we're okay, right? We're, we're, we're doing good, and we're going to do better. Uh, Lord will give us the strength. Won't you stand if you can and say hi to folks around you? 
Try to catch a name of somebody you don't know. Last day of the year. I was trying to find a scripture. Jeremiah 29. I think it kind of works. God says, I know the plans that I have for you, the plans for your welfare, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, declares the Lord. like we're in the dead of winter waiting on something better and am I really gonna hide forever over and over again I hear your voice let your light shine let your light shine for all to see and start a fire in my soul fan the flame and make it grow so there's no doubt Oh, denying, let it burn so brightly that everyone around can see that it's you, it's you we need. You only need a spark to start a whole blaze. It only takes a little faith. Let it start right here in the city And these old walls will never be the same Over and over again I hear your voice in my head They need to know I need to go Spirit, won't you fall on my heart right now Start a fire in my soul And fan the flame and make it grow So there's no doubt or denying let it burn so brightly that everyone around can see that it's you, it's you we need. You are the fire, you are the flame, you are the light of the darkest day. We have the hope, we bear your name, we carry the news that you have come to say. So start a fire in my soul And fan the flame and make it grow So there's no doubt or denying And let it burn so brightly That everyone around can see That it's you, it's you, we need Light on the darkest day. Start a fire. Amen. Start a fire in me. This next song is one of my very favorites. I know I say that a lot, but. I think we've done it a couple times, and I hope you appreciate it uh, like I do. It's called Make Room, and whether you're a new convert or you've been around the block, there's always space. We can make room for the Lord to work in us. We're to grow up into him and all things who is the head, even Christ. Make room.
of a commitment song. I feel it every time I sing it.
Lord God, as we face a new year, Lord, the things that we did well, help us and strengthen us to do them again. And the things that we missed, Lord, forgive us and give us what it takes to do better this year, that we be renewed by your spirit and that we we put on the likeness of you in holiness. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger be put away from us. Let us be kind to one another. Be imitators of God and walk in love. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. Our gospel text today is uh, found in the second chapter of Luke, uh, beginning in the 22nd verse. You can follow along on the screens. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it's written in the, did my car alarm just go off? (laughs) As it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many. In Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, and she lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. There's a there's a running joke in the youth pastor community that this Sunday, the, the first Sunday after Christmas, is often referred to as Youth Pastor Sunday. With Christmas wrapped up, the, the main event is over, and tired pastoral staffs around the country use what vacation days they have left, and they hand the reins over to the youth pastor. Let the kid have a shot at it. <laughs> So during my time of serving in youth ministry, I have preached this Sunday more than a handful of times. And I don't know what it is about it, but it can be kind of difficult to get excited to preach it. Uh, Maybe it's because there's this post-holiday letdown 
you know, the Christmas season is coming to an end. All of the extraordinary things are happened. You know, maybe, maybe Christmas Eve is just a tough act to follow. Maybe I was up too late having watched the Lions game fuming for a little longer than what I probably should have been fuming for. I'm just tired. I don't know. I don't know what the problem is with this particular Sunday. But we seemingly go from the incredibleness of Christmas to the ordinary everyday life just in the following week. Now on the surface, we're dropped into Mary and Joseph taking care of just everyday tasks and rituals. We're back to the routine of daily life. And it doesn't seem like there's anything that's too uncommon or spectacular about these ceremonies that they're participating in as they head to the temple. Every firstborn male that was born had to go under this dedication ritual that Jesus goes through. And and every mother had to go through the same purification process that Mary participates in. So instead of, of uniqueness and incredible like supernatural highlight moments of Christmas, a star appearing in the east, the likes of angels appearing in various circumstances, now it just looks like regular and mundane. But what's taking place in our gospel text today is anything other than a post-Christmas letdown or a mundane and boring. You know, what we have here in our text is indeed extraordinary. It's something that really, it can make your brain hurt when you stop to think about what's happening here. God, who created everything, who is above the law, who brought the whole universe into existence, has now come to the world through Jesus, his son, and is being put under the law. This is what's happening in these ceremonies here. This isn't By accident, this isn't uh, by design. Paul, in Galatians 4, he spends a a majority of Galatians kind of talking about this. Uh, But in in the fourth chapter of the uh, fourth verse of the fourth chapter, Paul summarizes the Christmas story by saying this. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. So just as we saw in our Christmas text this past week in Matthew 1, we are seeing a very important law-gospel distinction here that we have to pay attention to. It's it's essential for us as scripture readers to identify this distinction and to know whether or not it is we're dealing with law and gospel as we interpret the text. Now here in Luke, uh, he makes it pretty simple for us. Right off the bat, in verse 22, we know that we are dealing with the law. What is it that brought Mary and Joseph to the temple? When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus to the temple to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice. So Mary and Joseph are headed to the temple to fulfill the law. That's what's driving them. The law is the reason that they're going to the temple. And that's the main takeaway here. In these first parts of Luke, without question, Jesus is being put under the law. He's not taken away from what's happening down in the real and in the dirt. You know, things like ac- accomplishing religious tasks or being as pious as possible, proving one's holiness and goodness by upholding as many moral standards as possible, those things will not set us free. They won't earn our righteousness. They, they won't qualify us as righteous or good or holy. Because the law is always going to accuse. It's always going to demand and ask for more. It can't be satiated. Because no matter what our very best efforts are, we are going to continue to sin. And so the sacrificial system is put into place to help to atone for that sin. But it can only do it bit by bit. Like in this circumstance here, Mary couldn't even go into the temple. She was considered to be ritualistically unclean, having given birth, and she can't touch anything that's holy. So she's got to go to the temple courts and kind of do this handoff process to the priest with these pigeons. And it's interesting that, uh, that Luke includes the fact that uh, Jerry, Moseph and Joseph, I just smashed the two names. It's like a celebrity name thing. Joseph, Joseph and Mary um, are poor. Because the temple had this sliding st- structure where you could present, depending on how much money you had, 
uh, these, these doves or these pigeons. And so she presents these, these pigeons uh, and hands them over to the priest. And the priest, who was considered to be holy, then does the sacrifice on behalf of Mary to make her clean again. Because only the holy can do the work of atoning or of making something holy. But Jesus is going to bring about this new way of atonement, not earned through rituals and works, but given freely as a gift. And that way he gets rid of the law and allows it, the way that he gets rid of the law is, is, is he gets under it. And he allows it to do its full work on him. The cross is central in this whole thing because at the cross, Jesus defeats the law at his own game by losing and then by conquering it in the resurrection. And like rationally, that doesn't make any sense that God comes under the law to take our sin in the flesh. But that's the mercy of God. It's unfair. It's outside of the law. If we were able to do it on our own, then there would be no need for Jesus. And this was the consolation of Israel that's promised in Isaiah 40. This was the promise of that man named Simeon who was, he was faithfully waiting on this promise. And so we're introduced to Simeon here. And this is where, uh, in the narrative, we have this pivot now. No longer are we talking about law. But now we're seeing gospel at work. Luke describes Simeon as being righteous and devout. Now, we don't call Simeon righteous because he had purified himself according to the rituals of the temple. He wasn't devout because he carefully crafted a practice of, of holy living and, and diligently participated in you know, like religious ceremonies and ritual. This is where we're seeing the gospel break through. Because he was righteous and devout because he was hanging on to a promise. That's what qualifies him. He'd been waiting on the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, we could ask, what would it look like if Simeon was a devout man according to the law, if we were still dealing with law and not gospel? Well, he wouldn't be waiting on the consolation of Israel. He'd be far too busy with his own works and prayers and rituals and whatever else needed to be fulfilled in the temple. There wouldn't need to be this need to cling to a promise if he had things under his own control. But Simeon isn't doing any of that stuff. The consolation of Israel was not a command given to follow, saying you have to believe in this promise. But it was this promise that was given by God. And Simeon is clinging to that word. This promise that was given to him as a life changer. And it affected his entire life and it drove his actions. The Holy Spirit called Simeon through the prophecies that were saying the gospel. He's coming. The Messiah is coming. And that gave him faith. And that was his righteousness. And that's what made him devout. So Simeon goes to the temple courts and it's there that he sees Jesus. The fulfillment of the promise given to him. And he takes the child up in his arms, and he begins to praise God. And what we're seeing here with Simeon's response to this is true worship. Not worship that is an appeasement of a requirement or something that's forced, but it's an, a true response to what God has done, to what God is doing. Simeon now gets to hold his salvation how cool is that? The promise that he has been clinging on to for so long is now literally in his hands. And so he speaks these words of praise, and, and we know this as, as Simeon's song or uh, the Nunc Dimittis. Um, in these words, he's saying that we, what we're now seeing is this amazing revelation. Jesus' mercy is not limited or confined to just the Israelites, but it's for all people. And so out of Israel came the promise to all people, and that's what, make, uh, that's what made Israel so glorious. And then in his words to Mary and Joseph, Simeon is also foreshadowing what's going to happen 
now that God has entered the world in the flesh. He says this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that can be spoken against. So the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And then Simeon's words are echoed in Luke 12. Jesus himself says, I did not come to unite, but I came to divide. Because Simeon knows something about this baby. He's going to divide the world, not unite it. And this division is going to happen based on how people receive what this baby is going to say when he gets older, when he enters into his earthly ministry. What is it that he's going to say that is going to be so offensive? That's going to cause this division. He's going to say, you're not made right by the law. In fact, the law is going to condemn you. But apart from the law, I have come for this purpose so that I will take the sin of the world on myself. And that means your sin too, which means you're a sinner. And I will release you from death. And this is something that Jesus does, not just one time, but he does it eternally. And then once that happens, then you have a dividing point in the world. And so Simeon says the hearts of many are going to be exposed. They're going to be revealed. Quick poll here. Who wants to have their inner thoughts and truth revealed? (laughs) That's a hard pass for me, right? Andrea, I love that you are laughing (laughs) so hard. Um, If there's any confession that you need to make afterwards, we can get together. (laughs) That goes for all of you, though. We're not going to single anybody out. But I for sure do not want my inner thoughts and my what is going on up here to be on display for everybody to see at all. The truth reveals that we are not righteous and that we need a Savior. And we are bound to our sinfulness, but we don't want to hear it. And Jesus is going to reveal the truth about us, and the truth hurts. The division will be between those who seek righteousness according to the law versus those who receive it as a pure gift that absolves sin and releases you from it. Once you have that freedom, and that's what happens with Simeon and Anna, we see their their response to this delivering of this promise. You have life not only in this world, but you have eternal life in Christ. Jesus is giving you that life. What Jesus has come to do, he is going to do. He has done it. He has accomplished it for your sake. That's without question. You are no longer a slave, but you have been freed You have been adopted into God's family. Jesus is bringing the law's authority over you to an end. Jesus is ending the striving where you once tried to qualify yourself as good, as worthwhile. He is going to be the qualifier. He instead is giving you a promise of salvation and forgiveness and newness of life. A promise that can't be taken away from you. Something that is going to last for all eternity. Because you are adopted into God's family and made right in the name of Jesus. And so this promise now qualifies you. And it will direct you all of the days of your life. And so now you can respond with true worship. Giving thanks to God in all circumstances in life. And actually living in his peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for coming under the law, Lord, to meet us where we are, to recognize our bondage, our stuckness, our unworthiness. Lord, to come down and meet us where we are and end that striving, to free us to love us and to call us worthy and good and righteous, to call us children, Lord. Lord, let us now, with this news of of salvation, with this news of new life, Lord, with this promise fresh in our ear now, let us respond in true worship. 
giving you all the thanks, glory, and praise. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, amen. If you could, let's stand. We'll sing another song. Let's sing about and to our promise keeper. Come. 